Hi, all you wonderful Authors Love Readers listeners. Before we get into this week's show, I wanted to talk a little bit about why I am asking for Patreon donations. Let me tell you, it's really hard for me (laughs) to to ask. As my friends would tell you, I'm not good at asking for help at all. The reason that I set up the Patreon for the Authors Love Readers podcast, it is not for me as an individual author. It's strictly for the podcast. I would love for the podcast to become self-supporting because I've been supporting it to this point. The expenses include having the podcasts edited because you'll be surprised to know we talk longer than than you actually listen. And I have a monthly fee for hosting the files because these are big files. (laughs) And what I would love is to have people donate, you know, a couple dollars a month would be terrific. Two dollars a month would be 50 cents an episode. It would be a sign of support and it would help defray some of these costs. So that would be the way I could keep the podcast going on and on. And I hope you'll consider that. Thank you. Hi, welcome to this week's Authors Love Readers podcast, where we delve into the stories behind the stories. We're asking authors questions, some of them fun, some of them serious. And from their answers, you're going to learn things you never knew about the people who write the stories you love. My name is Patricia McGlynn. I'm your host and designated question asker. Hi, I'm Nancy Warren, and I'm an author who loves readers. Now, let's start the show. Hi, and welcome to this week's edition of Authors Love Readers Podcast. My guest this week is Nancy Warren. And one of the strange things about this is we haven't known each other that long. And that is very unusual. Usually usually I'm talking to people I've known into the dark and misty ages. But we've known of each other, and we met each other for the first time in February at the Unconference in San Francisco. So, Nancy, tell the listeners what you write, what your stories are mostly about. I write in two genres. Um, you know, like you, Pat, I've come out of romance for, as you say, since the dark ages, and I still love romance and I still write it. Primarily, I do a um, small town contemporary romance series set in Oregon. But I've also, in the last three or four years, branched out into Cozy Mystery, which is another area of writing that I just love. So I have a series in that, too. That's terrific. And tell us the the name of the Cozy Mystery series. Uh, It's the Tony Diamond Mysteries. Tony Diamond is basically a Mary Kay lady. And so she's kind of fun and larger than life and barges in where angels would fear to tread, which, of course, are all quite good qualities in an amateur sleuth. Yes, you can. It's hard to have shine retiring amateur sleuths. Yes. Because they retire and then you you don't have any sleuthing going on. Well, they work too, but yeah, I think she, for <laughs> me, she was more fun because she's so active. Yeah. Let's let the readers get to know you a little bit with some sort of off the wall questions. What in your childhood, did you have a book that just opened the door to you for for story where you said wow yes this is this is going to be my life I have two. So when I was much younger, Nancy Drew, and of course my name is Nancy. And so I felt a real connection to Nancy Drew, you know, and the team. And, um, I loved everything about those books and, uh, the way that, you know, she would always figure out what was going on. And so no surprise that I've ended up writing mysteries. Um, and my other one would be Pride and Prejudice, which my mother gave to me when I was so young, I thought it was called a pride and prejustice. But when I <laughs> when I finally did read it, it's still my favorite book of all time. And I still go back. There isn't a thing you can't learn about writing that isn't in Jane Austen's books. Do you know how old you were the first time you really read it? I was 12. Wow. That is young to, to be reading it. Yeah. And I don't think I understood it, you know, and then when I read it again, probably when I was about 15 and I probably read it every couple of years since then. And you know, you always get something different out of it. That's amazing. When you were growing up and so I think this is sort of a revelatory question of, of, uh, whether you were destined to be a writer. Um, did you have stories that you rewrote the ending to? 
I still do that. Yes. Um, I've yeah. always done it. Um, the most, the most recent one. Oh no, I'm hanging on. My mind is going completely blank here. Anyway, it doesn't matter, but I still do that. Particularly a book. Well, actually on Chesil beach, which they've just made a movie of. And I loved that book. It's Ian McEwen. And I thought it was wonderful, <sighs> but I still don't buy the end. And you know, sometimes I think men twist things to the dark because they think it makes it more literary, but really those characters, the way I read that story. And as you said, it's such an interactive journey. To me, it ends wrong. So yeah, I, probably, I might not even see the movie because I don't want to see that end or else I'll have to walk out before it's over. So yes, I did do that and I still do it. Yeah. And I, I didn't know that people didn't do that for a long time. I thought everybody did that. But. You know, Pat, there's normal people out there. They're not all <laughs> like us. <laughs> Well, that answers one of my questions of whether you think uh, um, authors and writers are different. So apparently the answer is yes. Definitely. I think there's a, I think we have a thinner membrane between us and the outside world, which is, you know, I think why so many of us creatives, you know, suffer from depression or mental illness or alcoholism, because I think we feel too much and it's, and it's too close, if that makes sense. And so, mm. yeah, I definitely think we we are a little bit different and it has both amazing, um, it's an amazing gift. But, you know, you have to be a little, a little bit wary too with your gift. What is your favorite taste? Chocolate. No. Oh. Uh, white chocolate? Dark chocolate? No, sadly, a, a really, a really rich and beautiful milk chocolate, preferably, oh. yeah, preferably Swiss or Belgian. Yeah, I, I am quite the connoisseur of chocolate. So, do you have a favorite brand? Um, probably, mm, probably Lindt, or I'll go with the Green and Black Organic. I like that one too. So, okay, well, take us away from that, and we'll say, what's your favorite color? My favorite color is purple. And why would you associate that with something? Um, I think well, my favorite my favorite flower is the iris. Um, I uh, love the ocean and sunsets, and I think it's a happy color. I don't know; it's got the cool of blue and the and the sort of bright excitement of red, and you blend them together. I've never never really thought about it, but it's my favorite color. Is there something from earlier in your life that you see you really bother you and now you look at it and you think, what was I thinking? Something earlier in my life that used to really bother me. Probably, um, oh, this is so awful, isn't it? But I think, I think it was my thighs. Like it was, you know, when you're young uh. and it's like, you know, if I could go back and say to my younger self and to all young women, you are so beautiful and you will never be more gorgeous than you are now, but it would be like you will pick you'll pick that one thing that is imperfect and stress about it. And now I think it's just so funny because, you know, who really cares? Once you get old and you get a bit wrinkled and everything's going south anyway, it's like I wish <laughs> I had been more loving and kind to my younger self. Yeah. Maybe that saves us from being too um, conceited <laughs> or, <laughs> or, or too self-loving. I don't. Is there, you know, because you should love yourself, but that's interesting. Yeah, and I'm always surprised how many sort of quite old, you know, much older people are writing kind of young adult books, and I wonder if that's it. Like it's it's something you can go back immediately, can't you? And I can feel that sort of the, the, the trauma and the, you know, the humiliation angst. and angst yeah. of being young. And so, yeah, um, yeah I, I think it's interesting. I think it also helps us write character, of course, you know, when you've understood that vulnerability and we all have them, everybody has them. Um, you know, it helps, I think, to, to write a character who has those. So do you have quotes that you like? Do you have a, like a, motivational quote in particular that well it's a perfect segue from what we were just talking about because my quote is um perfect is the enemy of good 
And I have to remind myself of that so often because it's very easy to become perfectionist and, you know, and, and, and particularly for, I think, beginning writers, you know, you're so worried about making that book perfect and it's never quite perfect enough. And maybe the cover isn't quite perfect. And I've really had to train myself. And I think really all those Harlequin deadlines really helped us, didn't they? Like you, there's a point Mm -hmm. at which, and, and I, 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 like you started out in media. So, you know, my first job was in a newspaper and that that piece has to be in by one o'clock and if it's five after one nobody cares and if the piece is too long they cut it from the bottom and so I think um yeah I think learning that you know there is a point at which you just have to let it go and it's never going to be perfect but it's probably good enough yes yes and done is better than perfect (laughs) Exactly. That's another good one. Yes. <laughs> so do you, ha- did, the, if, where did that quote come from? Do you know, did it come in particular? I always wonder if it came from your parents or from somebody you worked with, or if you found it. Yeah, my, my parents were, um, my, my quote from my childhood and it is, this is like a therapy session. You're hearing all my deepest, darkest secrets, <laughs> but the voice I hear in my head is my mother's and it's, you're the oldest, you should have known better. And I think that is that is a quote that has shaped my life more than any other, because of course, I think everything is my fault right down to global warming. Um, so <laughs> to have discovered this, which I probably read in a business book somewhere, I don't remember, but to have sort of now look at the other side and go, no, actually, you know, everything isn't my fault. I don't have to be perfect. And what I do is never, I am never going to be perfect. What I do is never going to be perfect. And mom, you were wrong. (laughs) This is a tough question. Have you had good advice that you've ignored? And then how did that turn out? Oh, I've had all kinds of good advice that I've ignored. I have a very unfortunate tendency to to get pulled away by the next shiny thing that that flies in front of my face, even when I know it's the wrong direction. And so I think the best advice I've had since I became um, uh, independently published is you've just got to stick to your knitting and, and stay in the same series and publish very regularly, the more frequently, the better. And I was doing this and doing very well. And then I decided that I wanted to move to the UK and that I would do a master's degree in creative writing, which was absolutely wonderful. And I had the most amazing year and I wrote a psychological thriller, which isn't even something that I don't even think I did a very good job of it. And I thought that I could continue to run my business. And apparently you can't do that. It was just, you know, all encompassing this master's degree. So yeah, if I just listened to that advice and not and waited and maybe done, you know, my master's in a few years, that would have been a much smarter thing to do. But then flip it on the other side. Have you had um, good advice that you ignored and eventually it turned out to be the right thing? You mean not doing the thing was the right thing? Yeah. Ooh. No, I can't think of any, unfortunately. I'm much oh, more likely okay. to. I'm, I, and I, I, I take people's advice too easily without sometimes thinking it, maybe it was right for you, but is this right for me? Um, I think I stayed with Harlequin way too long. Um you know, which seemed like the sensible thing at the time. And yeah, no, I actually can't think of anything. I'm sorry about that. No, that's okay. Don't apologize. I was just, I was thinking there were, because in fact, you're bringing up staying with Harlequin too long. I kicked myself for remaining with them. I was from the beginning, um, they kept telling me I was pushing the envelope and I couldn't see the envelope. So that was pretty clear indication we weren't the best fit. <laughs> so, and I, I sold well enough that they continued to, to want things from me, but never well enough to be left alone. So they kept fiddling, you know, and wanted me to do different things. And I kept trying because by gum, I was, <laughs> I was going to succeed. So I, I, eventually I was kicking myself. And then when the indie came up, I had the rights back to a lot of those books because I had just one of them in my hot little hands. It was no great um, uh, view into the future that this is was what was coming. I just wanted them in my hot little hand. And a, a lot of them were books that I had written during that period that 
subsequently I kicked myself for. So that's one of the things I think about that we can't necessarily know how things are going to turn out. And, and, and from that, I've, I've developed the saying that kicking yourself is a really lousy exercise program. So I could not I was, agree with you more. <laughs> yes, you'll get nice strong trying, calves, but lots of trying. Calves. <laughs> but you know what? Although we stayed too long with Harlequin now, and I'm just starting to get, you know, I'm they're, they're still hanging on to a load of my books, which is kind of, you know, something I'm, I'm working on right now. But it, getting them back is is like, oh my god, it's like free money. It's a book I don't yes. actually have to write, so that's kind of fun. Well, and it's like I. I to- <laughs> It's like getting old friends out of bondage. Oh, know? is that true? <laughs> and so are yeah. you now going back and those books that you were like, you felt like you weren't allowed to push the envelope as you sort of re-edit, which I assume you're doing, are you putting in that bit more envelope pushing? Or are you just saying, this is these are the books this woman wrote and she deserves to have them as they were at that time? Um, a mix. It yeah. depends on the story. A couple of them I have torn apart and rewritten because they were not what, what they were not my vision. Yes. Um, and, and, and like I just, I did four books in a series last year um, into early 2017 that I'd gotten back and it was a real mix. A couple of those books I, I just tweaked. One of them I did quite a bit of work. The fourth one, and not not the last of the four, but it was the second, I think. I really pulled apart and rewrote it because I'd had an experience, and I had a lot of editors there, and that particular editor wanted me to repeat stuff a lot, yeah. and it drove me nuts, and it, it became not my vision of the book in other ways, bigger ways than that specific little thing. But yes, I rewrote that that one and a couple others earlier um, in getting my books back. And it was it didn't seem to have it wasn't like the earliest books were pulled apart more. Um, it just seems to be uh, idiosyncratic. Uh, uh, with different books of yes. whether they really hit my vision or not. And so. sometimes it's the editor, isn't it? You know, they're just so busy trying to impose their vision on your book that it ends up being something completely different. That happened to me a few times. It did. Uh, well, I had, I think it's 34 editors in tw- maybe 32 editors in 24 books. So I had a lot <laughs> of editorial experience. Lot. My gosh. <laughs> yeah. And some of it was, some of it was, you know, editor churn. There yeah. was a lot of editor churn. Um, some of it was that I was on time, which I was told was early delivering my book. I totally, I, I have a, had an email from an editor that said I'd messed up her schedule by delivering on time. <laughs> so I don't uh, think that many people have that email. <laughs> deadline, you know, I think because I'd, I had edited for a long time myself was at the Washington post. And, um, I got a, accidentally, I got a copy of a notice from the editor to the copy editor that said, this author is very picky. If you change something, be sure you're right. <laughs> oh, that's the best note you could not see. <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah. Because I think, you know, it is our work and we have to stand up for it. Yeah. But I thought that probably did not endear me to, <laughs> to any of those people. <laughs> but I would have made the same choice again. So, <laughs> okay. Well, we're talking about editing and all that. And I think, a lo- I hope all of us actually have bad habit words or phrases that we use and then have to go back and find and change. So dish, share, what is your, what are yours? I think a lot of us have the same ones. Mine are those, you know, just only. Um, I have, um, I have a wonderful copy editor and she, and she pulls me up. Um, I have a funny way sometimes of just phrasing things where I think it's like, you know, again, being a woman and being a pleaser when I speak, I'm often almost sort of apologetic and I'll, and I'll sort of work up to what I want to actually say. Whereas in dialogue, of course, that tends to be really boring. So I notice she'll mm-hmm. catch, um, I don't know, little stupid phrases like, um, well, I don't know if you've thought about this, but, 
And then, you know, after the butt is really the only thing you need in dialogue. So that's a little bad habit I have. Do you ever hear, do you ever find yourself mentally editing your conversations and and trying to take those phrases out? It depends. Sometimes, um, if it's a bit of a boring conversation, then I'm more likely to do that. But you know, when you get sort of, <laughs> you know, when you're really engaged and you, and you and you're more interested in the content, then I think that's probably a better conversation. Even though maybe my prose isn't quite as precise. <laughs> uh, in addition to being an ongoing editor, I have my own strange little desert island. On this desert island, you get to bring three movies. So there's there's the capacity there to play movies. But for some reason, it will only ever play these three movies forevermore. So you have to live on this desert island. You get to bring three movies. You're going to watch them over and over and over. Which three movies? Well, probably it's no big surprise to you that I would choose um, Pride and Prejudice because that's like eight hours, um, the one with Colin Firth. Um, gosh, I'm very dull. I would probably take the Emma Thompson Sense and Sensibility, which was directed by Ang Lee and I think is just a wonderful movie. Um, and then to shake things up a bit, I might take... Oh, I don't know. A thriller. Um, maybe something like the 39 steps. I know it's very old oh, or, or, a, yeah. or a suspicion. A, you know, a Hitchcock film, I think, would be the third thing I'd take. Because I think they never get old. You know, you could, I could, you know, watch them over and over again. Those never get old to me. Suspicion is fabulous. And I understand that that, that was one where they changed the ending. That they were, yes. were going to have... Maybe I shouldn't say, ah, uh, okay. The, spoiler alert. If yeah. you have not watched the movie Suspicion, don't listen. Go la, 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 la. But they were going to have him be a bad guy. Yeah. And I. Yeah, I think in the original material, yeah. he, is a, he is a killer. And I think Cary Grant, wasn't it Cary Grant that was like, well, I'm, I'm certainly not going to be a killer in this movie. And so they changed it. But didn't that save us a job? Because, of course, we you and I would have had to rewrite right. that ending anyway. <laughs> but do, do you know, speaking of, you know, Cary Grant wasn't going to be a, move, uh, a murderer. There is a movie in which Jimmy Stewart is the murderer. And I... I it it's a thin man movie, and every time I see that, I'm like, "That's wrong." <laughs> that's just, that's that's just wrong. wrong, and yet interesting casting. Well, it was really early in his career. Yeah, yeah. So, all right, let's talk some about your writing, and we'll start. We'll start with the happy things in particular. Do you have a book that you can look at and say this was the most fun to write? This was the easiest writing experience. And and in that, do you find that easy writing experience necessarily translates into how people read it? Weirdly, the last book I wrote was like that. And, and usually, you know, you look back in the mists of time and you think books were easier to write than they actually <laughs> were. So this must have actually been this easy. And it was weirdly based on, um, it's my daughter actually, and my daughter who is 26 years old and um, and she's just one of those people, yes, yeah, she's pretty, but she's got some kind of a quality that, and the poor girl, it was much more of a curse. That, see, I'm doing it again. I'm, I'm talking, talking, I haven't got to the point yet. Um, it's much more of a curse, I think, than a gift is that is that these odd people fall madly and deeply in love with her like the instant they see her, like, you know, courtly love from the Middle Ages. And she had all these really funny things. I was sitting at, we had went for pizza one night and we're sitting and I had my back to the kitchen and, you know, she was sitting there and my pizza came up like some nasty round and her pizza came up in the shape of a heart. <laughs> And then somebody in the kitchen was obviously in love with her. And then they sent her a tiramisu dessert that, you know, we hadn't asked for because I got nothing. And <laughs> she would just be, you know, people would put ads in the paper, you know, this girl I saw in the coffee shop or they would, they would, she, you know, someone would be sketching and then they were sketching her. And, and so these things just kept happening to her and it was, and she was just horrified and mortified by the whole business. But I thought it was the most wonderful thing to be, you know, as a character, because of course it seems like, you know, other girls would be jealous of you. And yet it's such a curse because, you know, she like started not wearing makeup and trying to, you know, downplay her looks, none of which ever worked. So I thought that was such a fun thing to do for a character. And of course, this person is nothing like my daughter, but I think maybe because, you know, that's, 
that's something that I was so familiar with and it was just fun and it was different. And I kept, you know, making up these new fun things that would embarrass this poor girl even more. (laughs) And so that's the most recent one I wrote and it's called the Daisy game, which is, you know, he loves me, he loves me not. Um, And it's coming out. uh, It's out in June. Yeah. That was probably kind of just wrote itself. It was a gift. Yeah. Oh, love those books. Love those books. That's, that's a terrific story. Um, so, and, and that segues to what a question that we get asked in there. And one of the readers has asked of where our stories come from. So that you explain that one, but where do your other stories come from? Cause this reader says that she knows people who dream their stories and other people have characters start take up residence in their heads. I think the trouble is they all come from such different places. Um, uh, certainly I dream, I rarely dream plot, but I dream about my heroes. I know my book is going well when I dream about my heroes, oh. because of course I'm in love with them all. If I wasn't, you know, that would be really hard to write romance. If you have to be in love with your heroes. Um, I dreamt the other night, strangely, I'm, I'm working on a I'm working on a new series that's going to have some knitting in it, and I don't knit. And I dream, I dreamed that I went to a knitting store and I bought this pattern. I can see it in my head, and I bought this pattern for striped socks. And I bought the wool, and in my dream, I was knitting these socks. And when I woke up, I thought that's actually a really good idea because even though the even though the heroine doesn't knit you know, the knitting is important enough in this book that I think I've got to at least be able to sort of describe, you know, bad knitting and all the things that can go wrong. Yeah. Did I answer the question? I think there was more that I I don't know, but now I have other questions. So (laughs) what made you decide to, to use knitting when you, when you don't knit? Um, because the fun of books is, is all the things you don't do. Mm. Um, and, you know, the things I know how to do, yeah, I don't really want to write about cooking. You know, I'm a good cook and I cook all the time and it's not interesting to me. I'm much more interested in things I don't know how to do um, and things that are foreign. So, you know, that's why, like, that's why I think my favorite heroine, which you didn't ask me, but I'll tell you anyway, um, my fa- favorite heroine is Tony Diamond because she is so utterly unlike me. And to live inside somebody who is pushy and always says the, the wrong thing or, you know, the thing that no one else would ever say um, and like wear all that makeup and those, you know, restrictive clothes and high heels. I just, I think that's why I'm a writer. I get to explore being, because secretly I would love to be that person. Secretly, I would love to be able to barge in and not care what other people think um, and, you know, like sell makeup to people that are not remotely interested in it. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think that would be really cool. I totally understand that, that living vicariously, basically, and getting to experience and experiment with a lot of different things. But it also requires, maybe not so much with, um, with Tony Diamond, but with your knitting, you're going to have to, if you haven't already done, do research. Um, yes. Because your readers, a lot of your readers are going to know whether you get it right or not. So how do you approach that research? Well, knitting, of course, is pretty easy. You know, I will actually go to the store and get the, get the, or I might take a knitting. I was thinking I might actually take a knitting class. Um, uh, so that part's easy. The more complicated research um, is, I think so long as you approach it, you know, so long as your character isn't an expert in it, then I think mm-hmm. readers are willing, willing to be a bit more forgiving because it's perfectly understandable that an amateur sleuth, um, isn't going to be able to maybe identify exactly the, the kind of, you know, gun that was used. Whereas a law enforcement officer, you would expect them to know that. So that's one of the things I do to give myself a bit of a pass is I, I tend to, I wouldn't write about a knitting expert because I'm not good enough at, as a knitter. Um, however, of course, the beautiful thing about our world now and the internet is how easy it is to find experts and interview them. So oh, yeah. um, that's the other thing I think is you know, well worth taking the time to do. And interestingly, on a, another um, interview, we had a discussion about knitting. And I would say one of the things you should, whoever you talk to, get them to talk to you that, about the difference between, I refer to it as European and American um, style of knitting. And the other person said continental 
and English, I think. But one th- one way you hook the yarn with the tip of the needle, and the other way you your hand puts it over the tip. So they're very different, and there's they're different schools, and so there there's a little piece of research for you. <laughs> Well, that's fascinating because I didn't know that. Thank you. And most people either teach one way or the other. So you so get to know about both ways. You can have okay. a dispute. <laughs> Which is better? <laughs> I'm going to. Um, okay, when you when you're writing a book, do you celebrate when you start? Do you do you, do you mark moment, you know progress in the book when you finish? Do you do you pay attention to those things? Um, well, I definitely pay attention to them. I don't celebrate when I begin um, because the the act of beginning, I think, is its own celebration, isn't it? Like you start off with all this wonderful enthusiasm and, you know, that book is still perfect in my head when I begin. And then as I slog through and get to the middle and it all starts to fall apart, then that's that's the slew of despond for me and I just have to slog <laughs> through it. Um, and then I get to the end and then I got this from, um, from Shelly Adina, actually a really good friend of mine. And she used to buy herself a little piece of jewelry or a little gift at the end of every book. And I thought that was such a good idea that I have now started to do that myself. And it won't be, you know, it might be a pair of earrings or, or, you know, pretty necklace or something that, that reminds me of that book in some way. And, I think it works not only just from the point of view of obviously a reward, but I think psychologically, you know, we do, we love, we love rewards. And so psychologically, then when you start the next book, you're like, and when I finish it, what shall I buy myself? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, that's interesting. That's very interesting. I have never done that. I often start books in the middle. So, so the middle of the book doesn't bother me the middle of the writing bothers me. You start sense? books in the middle? Yeah. Okay, often. I've never heard that before. Really? I write Why? Out, I write out a sequence. Because that's usually when the characters come to me. I, I have this, often I have a scene in my head that just it, is there. And it's usually people in dispute of some sort, whether they're arguing or you know, overtly or, or not. Yeah. And I don't know who they are. And I don't, I, I liken it to being in a um, restaurant and eavesdropping and hearing this confrontation or, or dispute and then having to figure out how these people got there and then figure out where they go from there as well as th- little things like their names and <laughs> Yeah. what they do and what the plot is and all that. But it usually starts, like my first book, um, Hoops, it started with a man and a woman on a basketball court and she's in a she's in um, business clothes and she takes her shoes off because he tells her she can't come on the, on the hardwood with her heels on. And then, and he's in workout clothes. And they're going back and forth, and I know, you know, he, like he bounces the ball to her, and um, she's not very good at basketball. But I—that's what I got first, and I and I knew some of what they said to each other, but mostly I knew the feel of it. Yes. I, I knew I knew in particular what she was feeling. Don't that ask is- me where it came from. <laughs> I have that no idea. Is- fascinating i have never heard a process quite like that before (laughs) yeah well that's why i didn't fit very well with traditional publishing i think Um, i hear you yeah so if you didn't write what would you do well in my fantasy my fantasy nancy i would be a um broadway musical star i would sing and dance on broadway i think that (laughs) is the most marvelous job in the world and i i've just I just love musicals I love sitting there and watching them um but I can't sing or dance so uh, uh I know that's a so my previous careers were um were media and public relations and I probably I probably do something like that much more interesting to be singing and dancing musical star though yeah and that, see I had as a kid I had this vision that I was the lost heir to the Spanish throne which 
which had a few drawbacks in that I'm not Spanish. <laughs> yeah. So they, do you speak they Spanish? Hadn't, and they hadn't lost any heirs. <laughs> you know? so, but it never bothered me. You know, no. I was. <laughs> I don't, imagination. And again, I don't know where that came from. You know, this, this very Irish looking girl in the suburbs of Chicago. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They lost heir to the Spanish yeah. throne. <laughs> I like it though. <laughs> and maybe you are. Maybe you'll turn out to be one. Who knows? <laughs> okay. So in while you're writing, you're writing along, what's your favorite part of the process? Um, literally right before I start when, you know, I, I, I think we do, we have these sort of, you know, the platonic idea of the book, it's perfect. And yeah. the minute I put my fingers on the keyboard, I start ruining it. And that's the, that's so that's, both the, I know because it's never going to be perfect. There is no such thing. You know, even Brian Prejudice is probably not perfect if one looked hard enough, but, but there is that, see, cause I don't start in the middle. I actually start at the beginning, strangely enough. And there is that sort of push of energy and excitement. And that is, so that's the best part of the book for me. And then I think probably, um, there will be a scene, won't there? And you know, and I don't know where it comes from. A little bit like your, you know, your hoop story, where all of a sudden you thought the plot was going a certain way, and then it kind mm-hmm. of veers off, and and the magic happens. And there will mm-hmm. be a point somewhere where I get that scene, and it's like, now I get it. Now I know what the book is about. Now I know who these people really are. And then I think the end of the book, there's just such joy in in being done with it. Yes, because that's, uh, and that's when you were talking about as soon as you you put fingers to keyboard, it's no longer has that potential to be perfect. Because when it is just potential, it, it, it is, it can be perfect. But what offsets that is then finishing it, having it not only done, yes. but having it be able to go out into the world. Yes. And, and so that's the balance for no longer being perfect. Absolutely true. And of course, as you said earlier, and it's so true, then that book is no longer ours. It is a communication between author and reader and and readers find things that we didn't know we put in the book. Maybe we didn't put it in there, but you know, that it's, it's a, it's a journey for both of us. And so I think then at that, and that's, and that's a little bit hard for me. And I never read my books afterwards <laughs> because you know, they weren't the, I'll, I'll find all the mistakes and I'll hate them. But the, mm. it's not mine anymore. Now it's the readers. And, and I think what's so fun, especially nowadays when everybody, you know, puts reviews on Amazon five minutes after you publish it, is, is you see the book through someone else's eyes. And it's a different story sometimes than the one you wrote. Or, the, or what they saw in the person is something you didn't know you put there. I love that. Or, or possibly didn't put there. Because- exactly. Be- because it is so interactive, and I, as as a reader, I love that, and I love that I take possession of the story. As a writer, I'm not so wild about it. Totally like, get that. It, yeah, it, much easier to read a book than write one. Yeah, it conflicts with my megalomania too. Yeah. <laughs> my book, my story, my world. <laughs> it's got to be my way. <laughs> yeah. So, as you're writing the book, what do you do if you get stuck? Please don't tell me you never get stuck. <laughs> I get stuck all the time. Um, I will wander off and eat some chocolate. Um, I will take my dog for a walk. Love chocolate, we know. Chocolate, 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 chocolate cures so many things. Um, I might, uh, I might work on another book. I sometimes do that. Mm-hmm. I might watch, like currently, because of this knitting thing, I'm watching Miss Marple, the original series with Joe, or the earlier series with Joan Hickson, which I absolutely oh, love. Yes. It. And I know something's going on in the back of my head, even though it's not really work. I call it work because I think, you know, there's plot, plotting stuff happening in the back of my head. Sometimes I think you just really do need to step away and, you know, let those magic muses just kind of go at it in the back of your head. Yeah, but I find that if I just tell them, okay, get to work, it never works. I have to trick them. Okay. <laughs> And sometimes that's by working on something else. Yeah. Sometimes it's by doing certain things. Showers are really good. Yes. Um, walking the dog yeah. is really good. Yeah. Um, driving. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I see the, both the walking the dog and the driving. You can't, like, it's not like you're reading a book or you're watching television. You, It's sort of moving meditation, isn't it? Because, you know, you're focusing mm-hmm. on the road or you're, you know, you've got you've got the physical movement of walking and, you know, picking up your dog's poo, whatever you're doing. But your mind is free to create. So I think that is that is why those things work so well. Sw- swimming is another one. Anything like that where, um, you know, you're off, particularly in, in, in nature or near water. I think that's what's interesting about the shower, too. There is something very creative about water. Well, I, and it, when you talked about moving meditation, I think, I, and I do that also in yoga. I take uh, yin yoga, the really yes. inactive kind. And, and the instructor is always saying, this is very hard for a lot of people. And I'm going, not me. <laughs> I'm really good at just, you know, getting in weird positions and then just lying there. And then you're supposed to keep bringing your mind back. Yeah. So if your mind is wandering off to what you need to do next or anything, bring it back to your mat. And I'm thinking, heck no, I'm, uh, and the, the instructor has gotten to know me now and she will say, yeah, I see you back there in the corner plotting murders. <laughs> I see you plotting. Yeah. <laughs> but we're in that dangerous be, place. <laughs> we're supposed to be all Zen. And <laughs> I find that too with yoga and that Shavasana, you know, same thing, right? Oh, the first yeah. pose. And you're supposed to just be like free floating. And I have had some of my best ideas in Shavasana or that plot problem. Just you break it through. It's wonderful. So the corpse pose is particularly good for murder mystery. Excellent <laughs> <Plotting>. murder mystery. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's a good thing I have an understanding <laughs> instructor there. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so what do you read for fun? What do I read for fun? All, all kinds of different things. Generally not in the genre I'm currently working on for obvious reasons. Um, so I just read a wonderful book called, um, I, I met this woman in Berlin at the Love Letters Conference. She's Swedish. And she wrote this book called How to Fall in Love with a Man Who Lives in a Bush. And it's about, she she met this homeless guy in, I think it was in Stockholm. And he was Canadian, funnily enough. And and they fell in love. And it's this wonderful, funny, bra kind of memoir story that I loved. Um, what else do I read? I read, I'll read sort of books about, about what I'm do, you know, kind of what I'm doing nonfiction. So um, I might read, well, I probably wouldn't read a knitting memoir, but, um, you know, if I'm doing like a, um, I don't know. I don't have a lot. I don't do a lot of police procedural stuff, but obviously when you do murder mysteries, there are, you know, there is a cop who is kind of the love interest and um, the, the kind of assistant sleuth in my book in my Tony Diamond series. So I might read about, um, you know, sort of police procedural stuff mm-hmm. um, in a nonfiction way. I do. I do that sort of thing. One reader asks if when we finish a book, do we think about the characters and do we miss them? And I think that's so wonderful because it's very clear that this char- this reader does, misses those characters and thinks about them. Isn't that wonderful? Yes, of course uh-huh. I do. And I think that's yeah. probably that's when I'm more likely to dream about the heroes is when the book is done because I do miss oh. them. And you've been part of that world. And sometimes you'll think, oh, I wonder if she's pregnant yet. <laughs> You know, if you ended when they fell in love, like, yeah, I do. And they are, of course, they're part of my world as well. And, and I I think it's lovely that they become part, part of readers worlds. And so, um, yeah, how delightful. Does that spark additional books for you? Well, of course, you know, and now, and now it's such a thing to do these rather long series. And so what's fun about a series like my Take a Chance series is I'm now in book seven. And, you know, the people who fell in love and got married in book one, they've just had a baby. And so what's mm-hmm. really fun about these, and I think that's why readers love them so much, is you never say goodbye. You know, they show up yeah. at the family barbecue or, you know, the next wedding or the baby shower or whatever it is. And so we sort of see this. It's not a, just a story anymore. We're building these communities of you know really genuinely warm and loving people that we have come to know when they all got their own story so that's a night quite a nice way to do that so we never really you know until the whole series is over we don't actually have to say goodbye i did a a cowboy wedding in my wyoming wildflowers series and 
I had everybody. Yeah. <laughs> Wedding. I, and I even had some people from uh, some other series because they're in the same geographic area. Oh, and I thought, nice. oh, yeah, they probably know each other. So I have this like cast of thousands. And <laughs> I, I put a warning at, on the uh, book description that this was really for, for readers of the Wyoming Wildflower series. And if you hadn't read it, this was not the place to start. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you need a bit of background for this one. <laughs> yeah. It's nothing like telling people don't read a book. Yeah. <laughs> but I thought, oh, you know, the people who had been following the series, I hope they had as much fun with it as I did. But somebody new to it, it would be like being the the one plus at a wedding where you knew nobody and everybody else knew each other. So Exactly. <laughs> oh, that does sound like fun though, Pat. Yeah. <laughs> but I agree about the community, absolutely. Yeah. Um Another reader asks, what is your favorite place to write and why? And does it have an inspirational view? And I think that's so sweet of her that I think she wants us to have an inspirational view. I think if I had an inspirational view, I wouldn't get enough work done. I'd be too busy <laughs> looking at my inspirational view. So I do have an office. I'm sitting in it right now. It's got all my favorite books. All my old friends are around me. My dog oh. is at the moment curled up at my feet. Um, that part works for me, that sense of familiarity. Um, but I often, and actually that's another thing I do if I'm a bit stuck. I will often just pack up my laptop and I'll go to a coffee shop I love ferry journeys because, or, you know, train journeys where you hopefully don't have any internet access and it's just you and the story. And maybe like in England, you know, I I would be on the train all the time. And sometimes you'll be like three and four and five hour journeys. And they're the best because you can really get a lot of work done. And of course you look out and there's the English countryside going past. Yeah. So that's a really nice and I think movement, again, you know, going back to that sort of what do you do mm-hmm. with your stuff, any sense of movement, you know, psychologically, we, we, we're going forward, aren't we? So that helps. Yes. I, when you first said you went on fairy journeys, I, I was thinking F-A-I-R-Y. And I'm thinking, wow, what oh, <laughs> did she do this? <laughs> Ah, ah, ah. My fairy comes and picks me up on her wings and goes on her journey. Wouldn't that be just wonderful? Uh, boy, I had this vision, Nancy. <laughs> Sorry to disappoint you. It's an old boat. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> so our imagination or my imagination gets me in trouble again. Um, <laughs> okay. As long as we're talking imagination, this is a terrific question from a reader. If you could write a book with any author, alive or dead, who we might know about the uh, already, but who would you want to work with and why? Oh, that's a really good question. There are so many. Um, Agatha Christie would be really fun. Um, I don't think I'd want to write with Jane Austen. It would be too intimidating. That was the one that was and oh, okay. She's perfect. And I, and I, what would I bring to the table? Um, Susan Elizabeth Phillips. I think she's just a wonderful and she's so funny. And I would hope that I could, um, that I could learn a lot about, you know, sort of timing and humor, which I think she does so brilliantly well. Um, who else? Live or dead? Maybe Somerset Mom, that was wonderful. Um, I think I could help him because he's wonderful and brilliant at plotting, but I think his female characters leave something to be desired. Mm. And so I could maybe make those a bit better. Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah. Where, where it could be mutually beneficial. I think, because I think that's what you want, isn't it? You want you want to think, well, if I was writing with someone, you'd want to think maybe their, the books would end up better than just you, you were, you know, writing on someone else's coattails. Now, see, when you said no to Jane Austen and no to, um, well, you didn't say no to, but you said Agatha Christie. What I'm Im- immediately thinking is, ooh, Agatha Christie, you could find out what really happened? Exactly. She she's such kind of a fascinating from woman. Her she's, life. A, she's a mystery novel herself, and I th- and Jane Austen. You could find out who she really loved and what she what her life was really like, and what happened in those in those what was it nine years that she didn't write? What happened then? Yeah, uh-huh. I think um, I think it would be fascinating. But I wouldn't want to write a book with her. I would write books with Agatha Christie. Um, I think that. Um, yeah, I think it could be really fun. 
<laughs> See, my mind immediately went to finding out their, <laughs> their I know. secrets. I know, because that's what we do, yeah. right? We're looking for character. There's a there's a British author named Sophie Hanna who actually has been invited by the estate of Agatha Christie and she's but she's like re you know, she's dug up Poirot and is and is writing them and I wonder what that's like for her. I don't know, because she's you know, I mean but she's sort of put on the Agatha Christie hat and, and she's writing them without unless Agatha Christie's come back, uh, and, you know, she's doing them without any help, but it'd be kind of nice to work with the actual author, I think. Would you, would you collaborate or is that something that interests you? I absolutely would in a minute. It would have to be the right person and the right project, but um, yeah, I, I absolutely would because it's such a lonely business, isn't it? This writing of ours. And I'm reasonably extroverted and I like people and I think it would be fun and you could sort of keep each other on track and maybe, you know, the things I'm not good at, someone else would be very good at and vice versa. I'm terrible at, I'm not good at setting and I'm not good. I have no sense Mm -hmm. of direction. I can't do sort of, you know, the, I don't know, the something was facing north and in the southwest corner, you know, which I think is you, you find in a lot of mysteries and thrillers and I'm hopeless at that. So I would quite like to work with someone who had that kind of strength. And then, you know, my strengths are probably character and humor, I think, are what I do well. So that would be what I would maybe bring to the table. No, I think it would be fun. Yeah. That's interesting. I I don't, my megalomania kicks in again. My story. Yeah, wouldn't work for you. (laughs) And as listeners, if people listen to the podcast all the time, they've probably heard me say before that my, um, my parents and my older siblings told me that my very first phrase uh, multiple words was do it my own self <laughs> oh that you know and, and even though I haven't known you that well Pat that doesn't surprise me at all <laughs> yes <laughs> so that might not be the best <laughs> the best collaborator um, in the making there <clears throat> no unless it was very clearly your book your world and they're just you know doing what they're told then you'd be okay. oh yeah a minion a minion <laughs> yeah, I could take right, a minion. that's what we need <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so another uh, two two readers have asked these questions and I t- I always put them together and maybe I shouldn't in the future but f- for this time having introduced it that way I will. Um one says, "How much does it bother you to find editing errors after the book goes live or is printed?" And the other says, "When the cover image doesn't match the character description, and she says, a pet peeve of mine, how does it feel for the author? Well, of course, nowadays that we're indie publishing, all that is on us. So I feel horrible if I get, you know, and, and people are, are quite good. Um, I think there are readers who who will write to Amazon or they write to you and they let you know. And I do occasionally get that. And they'll say, oh, you know, I found this typo. Um, I found you know, some inconsistency. And so then me as the author now, because I'm also the publisher, I can go back and fix that. So that's really actually quite helpful. In the old days, when it was, you know, Harlequin or another publisher, and I had no control over that, that would be heartbreaking and you can't fix it. Um, Covers are the same. Um, you know, we're, we're in chart, we're our own publisher now. And so what, one thing I've learned about covers, which is really interesting, because I've always been as a reader, I'm like that. I'm like, okay, she's blonde on the cover. And in the book, she's clearly a brunette. That's really annoying to me. What I've learned now that, you know, I have to purchase covers and get them designed is in fact, what you actually want is the, is the feeling of the book is the emotion that's in the book. So, it, so it, now I care much less actually, if the, if the character on the cover doesn't exactly match my character in the book, I'll probably just change the hair or color or whatever was wrong in the book. If I can find the photo of the couple that is saying what I want to say or the, you know, whatever the background, whatever it is that about that picture that I liked, I'll probably go with the right feeling on the cover and then worry about the details in the book. So we've talked quite a bit about readers. What sort of interactions have you had with readers? How do they approach you or or what are the things that they often say to you? Well, of course, it's changed quite a bit over the years. We used to get those lovely reader letters. Um, and then more, more recently, it's more likely to be emails or you see people at conferences. Um, my very favorite, the one that sticks out in my mind the most I wrote this book and it was a it was a blaze. It was a fairly early blaze, and it was called Whisper. And 
Um, it's one of those, you know, she really knows him, but, but she doesn't really real, realize she knows him and they always meet in the dark and, and he whispers, he never speaks in his normal voice because she would know who he was. So he's got some reason, which I can't remember why. Anyway, so he, he, he always whispers to her and it's kind of, you know, a thing all through the book. And I got this, I got this letter from this lovely letter from this woman who said, who said, I could hear his voice and I'm deaf. <gasps> Isn't that oh wonderful? Gosh, yeah. that's fantastic. Yes. Yeah. But wow. other than that, it's usually, you know, people are lovely, aren't they? And they come up and, oh, you know, would you sign my book? And I love this character or whatever. Like people, I, I find readers are absolutely lovely. And um, and sometimes I learn something. As, as you, we were saying earlier, you know, you've they've seen something in the book that maybe you put there and you didn't know you did, or maybe you didn't. Mm-hmm. And they, you know, they, they brought that themselves. And so that's always fun. I find chatting to readers about, um, about things like that. For a new reader, um, I think probably a lot of them will be now be looking for whisper. <laughs> uh, but for a new reader, where do you think is the best place to start? Somebody who's never read any of your books. Well, probably the best and safest because I have, I think I've got three things that you can read for free. Um, So you can start the very first book in the Chance series, which is called Kiss a Girl in the Rain. That's free everywhere if you want to give me a try. The first Tony Diamond, which is called Frosted Shadow. Um, and (laughs) So all the titles are makeup? Thank you. Yes, because she sells makeup. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Um, and what else? And then I've got a, the Almost Wives Club, which is a series, a bride series of five books. And the first one of that is free. And I think it's called the Almost Wives Club. So yeah, so that would be the easiest way. And it costs you nothing and you can give me a try. And then if you like them, then hopefully you'll keep reading in the series. Yeah, I'd love that. I have a couple books free to a romance and then the first book in the mystery series. And to me, that makes so much sense because it's a way for us the reader and the author to see if we're a good match and if we're not no harm no foul exactly (laughs) you can tell tell old sports writer here yeah (laughs) (laughs) and you know we go on and you as a reader you find somebody that you really love and as a author i find somebody who really loves my work um so i i think that's a, a great way to introduce our work to people Yes. And I find, I find new writers that way too. You know, sometimes I'll be like, Oh, oh yeah. it's free or it's 99 cents. I'll give it a try. And of course, you know, we're still asking something, aren't we? Like, even if they don't pay money, you're still asking someone to give up their time. And there's a lot of demands on our time these days. So I'm very grateful. Someone wants to borrow my book for free and read it. And if they like it, hopefully they'll go on. And if they don't like it, and it wasn't for them, as you say, no harm, no foul. And you know, yeah. they're not wasting their money or their time. So I'm fine with that. Yeah. One of my favorite communication from readers, and I, I got a couple that um, recently that said, you know, this free book, and, and it, they both happened to be for Sign Off, the first book in my mystery series. And they said, I, I got this free a long time ago, and it sat in my queue, and I just, um, I finally read it, and now I want to read all the other books. And I thought, yes, yes, Perfect. this is what you hope for. So so if our free books are sitting in your in your reader, Grab those Nancy Warren and Patricia McLenn books and give them a shot. Give them a try. Okay, Nancy, where can people find out more about you and your books? Um, So my website, of course, which is nancywarren.net. I tend to be on Facebook. You can find me on Twitter. And yeah, and that's about it. And if you're in Victoria, come and find me. No. (laughs) Ooh, be careful about that one. (laughs) Well, I, d- I didn't give an address, you know, to say, yeah, I guess that was a silly thing to say, but I do, you know, writing conferences and conferences where, where readers show up. So I'm not that hard to find. Yeah. Those of, those of us who write murder mysteries think, no, don't say that. <laughs> I know. I know. If, you, if I only wrote romances, I'd probably be more open to it. And Nancy Warren is spelled the usual way says the former journalist, the um, URLs or URLs will be in the show notes for, for those of you who prefer it that way, as I do. Uh, is there anything I haven't asked you that you would like to answer? Is there anything I haven't asked you that you wouldn't like to answer? 
<laughs> well, it's been very comprehensive. It seriously did feel like a therapy <laughs> session. So I'm going to have to go lie down now. <laughs> don't don't lie down yet. We still have the either ors, and this is rapid fire. Okay, okay. you ready for this? Yes. Um, start with a really tough one: appetizer or dessert? Appetizer. Heels or slippers? Slippers. Binge watch or make the watching last as long as possible? Always binge watch. Day or night? Mm, depends on the activity. Night. So, probably I'm more a night person. Paper plates or best china? Oh, best china. House decorating or gardening? Can I pass? I don't do either of those things. <laughs> Opera or show tunes? Show tunes. Pickup or sports car? Mm, sports car. Hiking boots or cowboy boots? Oh, I'm a big hiker. I hike all the time. Okay. Spring or fall? Spring. I know you chose appetizers, but I'm still going to ask. Ice cream or cake? You know, I'm just not really a dessert eater, apart from chocolate. Probably chocolate cake I would eat or a brownie. There you go. Cruise or trekking vacation? Trekking. Daisies or roses? Roses. Hot air balloon or train trip? Train. Cat or dog? Dog. Uh, coffee or tea? Tea. Winter Olympics or Summer Olympics? Mm, probably the winter. Nail polish or bare nails? Oh, nail polish. Last one. Grab the best first or save the best for last? I think I'm going to save the best for last. That was really good. You went through and made decisions. I'm really impressed. A lot of us <laughs> authors are going, but I want some of this and some of that. <laughs> so that was, yay, Nancy. Yay, I did it. It's a bit stressful, though, wasn't it? Sometimes you're like, no, but then sometimes I like to wear high heels. Yeah. You know. <laughs> well, thank you for playing with us for this time and really appreciate your being here. And to all of our listeners, I hope you'll come back next week for another edition of Authors Love Readers podcast when we'll have another author talking about the stories behind the stories. Until then, have a great week of reading. That's the show for this week. Hope you enjoyed it. And thank you for joining Authors Love Readers podcast. Remember, you can always find out more about our guest authors in the show notes. And you can find out more about me at www.patriciamclin.com. You can also send in questions to be asked of future authors at podcast at authorslovereaders.com. Until next week. Wishing you lots of happy reading. Bye. If you like this podcast, we hope you'll consider becoming a supporter through our Patreon page. With a small monthly donation as little as a dollar a month, you can help with the hosting and editing costs that make the show possible. To thank our Patreon supporters, we offer them special bonuses. Find out more at AuthorsLoveReaders.com or at Patreon.com slash AuthorsLoveReaders. That's P-A-T. R E O N. We also hope you'll subscribe to this podcast and leave us a review wherever you listen to us. Both of those help more folks find the podcast. Of course, the very best way for other folks to find the podcast is for you to tell them about it. So we sure hope you will.